Hello, everyone. It's great to be uh, with you and learning with you. Thanks so much for joining us. The presentation today is entitled Two Early Medieval Illuminated Manuscripts. And we'll consider two medieval masterworks of Anglo-Saxon and Celtic and Irish book arts, the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Book of Kells. These sacred works of art and texts drew inspiration and motifs from the culture and spirituality of the earth place and the monasticism of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. As is our practice, we'll have a meditation first to prepare us for the presentation. So I'll draw up an image uh, for you that we'll work with. Now here before you, you see one of the illuminated pages of the Book of Kells that I'll tell you more about during the, the uh, presentation. This is folio 291, verse ORB, and it's a portrait of John, the spiritual master or evangelist John. You notice he looks out to us holding in his left hand his gospel, his book of the law. In the beginning was the word. And in, in his uh, right hand, he holds a large scribe's pen and just said towards his feet, there's actually a, a, um, an inkwell to dip it in. So you see here both the action uh, of both the interiority and uh, both exteriority. We see the great whole halos around him, the aura. And so we have this wonderful display of geometry, interweaving designs that are known in Celtic and uh, early medieval art. One of the things that's very striking about this uh, work as well as you'll see on the side here is a hand and an arm, hand and an arm, feet, and at the very top, there's also a head. So we see depicted there uh, the Christ and uh, also suggesting oneness with God, the creator. In a way, we have the microcosm inside here with the spiritual master looking out to us, inviting us uh, to partake in the way of spirituality through the, uh, his book and we, Rosicrucians refer to mysticism, the art and science of love, the knowing of natural and spiritual laws to be able to live in, in harmony. We see the wonderful harmonious expression in, of our enthroned John here. In a way, it's an exaltation of the master within, the God within, when we work with it. We find here as well a suggestion of both knowing the crucified Christ, but also the macrocosmic cosmic consciousness or Christ consciousness and God the creator. Somewhat like the Hermetic cross, where we have the small rose as the microcosm, and then the and the small cross with it, and then the large rose cross, uh, which contains the small rose and cross. Here we have the body of Christ and God the Creator, containing uh, the body of the spiritual master John. He looks out to us, in inviting inviting us to partake of the inner spiritual way, which we'll do in a moment. So we'll apply this inspiring image about it shows the system and order, not only of the media environment of it, but of the cos cosmos. There's a wonderful spirit, uh, spirituality and symbolism of color uh, in this illuminated work that I'll talk about a little bit more after the meditation. Uh, so prepare yourself now. Uh, in a way you may wish to see yourself as your inner self enthroned like the master John here at the center of the cosmos, uh, at the center of the body of the uh, divine, a macrocosm. So take a few deep neutral breaths as we look at this sacred diagram, dating from the, around the year 800 CE. See the radiance of the aura, the spiritual force when we're attuned with the cosmic, our auras are extended. And when you're ready, you can close your eyes and take a few deep neutral breaths. You wish, you wish to have your hands in your laps, palms down, knees at right angles if you're seated, feet flat on the floor connected to the temple of the earth, and forming a right angle at the knees spine upright so we can breathe un, unhindered. Just enjoy the gentle rhythm of the breath, the beautiful harmony in your order. It's within our body and minds, connecting us to the cosmic keyboard 
all the vibrations of the cosmos, higher and higher rates of vibration and lower and lower rates of vibration, all linked together through notes and sharps through the octaves. And you may wish to take rather deep breaths that are comfortable. And if it's comfortable with you, you may wish to keep your mouth closed and just breathe through the nostril, but just if your health condition allows it. Just breathe through the nostrils, that then necessitates us to take deep breaths. But if you prefer with your mouth open, that's fine. You may want to breathe right now just a little slower than usual. And particularly, you may wish to extend or elongate your exhalation because that'll immediately activate the vagus nerve for a relaxation response. And relaxation then activates healing in our bodies to help make us whole. Breathing is a very simple act, but in a way it's the way that the cosmos was created through the word, the going forth of the breath in the word. So too in our in a smaller scale by the law of correspondence in our microcosm. Our breath brings in the vital life force, Rosicrucians know. And when in Eastern traditions is the chi and the prana. That vital life force allows various flow in our body, animates us through our various systems, electromagnetic, our neurology, but also our autoimmune system, but also our circulatory system and our respiratory system, various other systems working in harmony and order, especially when we relax. Another beautiful function of this concentration on the breath is it starts to harmonize the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. It does that through heart rate variability to be optimal. Our heart rate changes but over very briefly over time. To relax, spiritualize our natures, start to have the optimum heart rate variability, which then harmonizes the two nervous systems. When they're fully harmonized, it brings forward a state of enlightenment. One of the wonderful things about concentration on the breath is it stills the outer nature and body. But then it gradually allows, like we're looking down into a deep, well, clear well of water, become very still in our deeper nature and our master within or divine within can increasingly declare its presence, our true nature to help guide us. To continue in this process and to apply the wonderful portrait of John in the Book of Kells, this depiction of the microcosmic being and the macrocosmic being. Let us apply the Rosicrucian booklet, Liber 777, and its instructions on meditation. You can say together with me, may the divine essence of the cosmic infuse my being and cleanse me of all impurities of mind and body, that I may enter the celestial sanctum and attune in pureness and worthiness, so mote it be. Now let us continue to arise up from the room where we are. Use all our psychic capacity and imagination to rise up not only of our room, but the house or home where we're dwelling, up over our neighborhood. Let's continue with the neutral breathing at your own regular pace. Use the inner spiritual force to rise up now over your city or geographic location 
rising up over your province or state and see the weather systems and the geography, coastal area with seas, mountains, high hills, plains, desert, whatever, lakes, rivers, whatever is suitable for your province or state. And you continue to rise up further and further and see down below your country or nation. See the great depiction of landforms, weather systems, maybe great spiraling weather systems. See the beauty of it all and then rise up further and see the continent where you dwell. And then the hemisphere, either the North or South hemisphere, wherever you are, and rise up higher again and see the beautiful blue jewel of the earth, a blade spheroid close to a sphere in shape, revolving about its axis on the North and South Pole and sense the great harmony and order and we're the earth alive like a living or organism, which it is. And sense all the people and creatures down there and the various expressions of life force there that will radiate love and well-being to when we reach the heights of the celestial sanctum, but continue and look up as you continue to rise further and see the solar system and see the great elliptical orbits of the earth and this, around the sun. Also, the orbit of Venus and Mars, and the huge planet Jupiter, and the large planet Saturn with its beautiful rings. See the beautiful harmony and order. Just like the harmony and rhythm of our breath, see how the great motions of the cosmos partake of the vibrations of the cosmic keyboard. And then let's look up from our solar system and see more of our great home in our Milky Way galaxy and see as we rise up faster and faster, see not only this, the sun, our, our local star, but other stars and stellar phenomena like black holes and quasars and pulsars and supernova, and binary stars. See interstellar gases and nebulae. See even the rosette nebulae, which is in the beautiful rose color shapes. It's suggestive of the profound meaning of the rose to Rosicrucians great rose that unfolds within us as we mature and grow and keep rising up through the, the vastness, the Milky Way galaxy and start to sense its large arms and its great motion as it swirls around and exit right out in the Milky Way galaxy and look back at its great spiraling arms and all the bodies, the celestial nature within it and around it and then look up and see many other galaxies and nebulae and wonder at the system and order and the magnificence of it all and sense the universe alive, various forms of expression of life, but also as a being as a whole. And take speed up now tremendously fast, way beyond the speed of light. Use great inner spiritual force. Don't be passive at this time. We'll turn into and surrender once we reach the heights of the celestial sanctum. But for now, just go fast by myriad stellar phenomena, quasars, the pulsars, the binary stars, black holes that help keep the universe in balance, the dark matter. Now see not only galaxies in their various shapes and forms, but also what astronomers call clusters of galaxies together. Some of them are revolving about their axis. See many, many clusters of galaxies. Enjoy the beauty and rhythm and the harmony of the spheres, great music of the cosmos. And take in now what astronomers call not only clusters of galaxies, but clusters of clusters of galaxies, the super clusters some of them revolving about their axes. You see the universe as a great body of soup, clusters of clusters of galaxies or gathering super clusters. You speed by them all and see the great range of colors Take in now the full range of vibrations of the cosmic keyboard, taking in beyond what we can physically sense, but take through the psychic faculties, the tremendous range of vibrations, a wonderful, harmony and symphony of sound, more beautiful than the earthly music, which 
composers on earth work to, to replicate through their inspiration in the cosmic. And now sense the great movement of the universe, the cosmos itself about its great axis matching the cosmic axis in our holy temple of our body through the law of correspondence. And sense the great motion of the super clusters around this great axis, galaxy after galaxy, star after star. And reach towards that great cosmic axis about which the cosmos revolves and come in, speed in towards its midpoint. And when you reach that point, just dwell there for a time and take in the great motion of the cosmos all around you, which reminds you of the Rosicrucians call the cosmic, all natural and spiritual laws and the great universal intelligence back of the cosmos. Following the instructions of Liber 777, you may wish to picture now that you're at the center of the cosmos, at the center of your being. For as we've risen up into the cosmos, we've gone deep within our nature with the law of correspondence to the still center of the being where our divine master resides, our true guide in life, our true nature. You may wish to picture your celestial sanctum now as some inspiring work of sacred architecture or some inspiring place in nature, maybe a vantage point of a high mountain or by a seaside and seeing all the waves come in suggesting vibrations of the universe, or maybe a sacred grove or a Hindu mandir or, or a Jewish synagogue or a Christian basilica church or temple or Buddhist stupa or prayer hall or a Hindu mandir or a sikudar. Fill in the sights and sound of your sacred place, the built form or in nature. Take in all the sights and sounds. They wish to sense the incense there, rising up, suggesting the raising of consciousness. There may be beautiful stained glass windows with various spiritual laws and principles and sacred stories depicted there. Sense also the presence of other seekers with us on this teleconference and other Rosicrucians and other spiritual masters and the officers of our order there may be the imperator with the grand master conducting a sacred convocation there now. Fill in all the sights and sounds, various stimuli of the senses, make it real and vital and feel an exhilaration, just like you felt with rising up into the cosmos and the cosmic. Feel exhilaration to be in this special sacred place, your celestial sanctum. And once you have it filled in, just dwell there in peace profound, just surrender. Just be passive, the outer nature. Be totally receptive to the divine within and the magnificence of the cosmos, handiwork of the creator before you. The high and holy lessons that are ever before us and within us. Just be still and receptive to them now. Grateful for this opportunity be more fully oneself. Co-agent, co-worker with the cosmic. Just continue to let the outer nature breathe back and forth. Feel the great harmony of the cosmos through your breath. Enjoy the Gentle rhythm, if you find your mind wandering, just lovingly gent and gently, no judgment, it's all part of the process. Bring it back to the breath of the holy temple, at the center of your cosmos, at the center of your being, within your holy and sacred celestial sanctum. As we breathe, increasingly sense the still center within us. Feel the divine within's presence, enriching and ennobling us. With each breath, you may be increasingly feeling the enriching tingling of the vital life force, particularly the cosmic essence, its positive polarity, tingling throughout the holy temple, healing and rejuvenating us.
at your sacred center, in your celestial sanctum. You may wish to picture yourself like the spiritual master John, his portrait in the Book of Kells, enthroned at the center of the cosmos, at the center of your being. It's a divine sovereign, divine archetype, a sovereign. Identify the divine within enthroned this way. And we call the great body, the Christ principle, the Christ consciousness, the cosmic consciousness surrounding the Master John. Take your mind and expand it to encompass the entirety of the cosmos. Have the mind of the Christ enter into the cosmic mind, in other words. You may find it helpful to picture yourself expanding in, to encompass the entirety of the cosmos bringing your mind with it so that you are the cosmic mind, be the cosmic mind, experiences the cosmic mind experiences, assume the cosmic mind now. And while we're absorbed and fully identified with the cosmic mind, let us radiate love and well being to all those who have petitioned the Grand Lodge of our jurisdiction, the Rosicrucian Order of Amor, for health and healing and guidance. And radiate love and well being to all those who have petitioned our affiliate bodies for the same. And radiate love and well being to all those that you know who are in need, and to all those who are in need, to all beings in need throughout the cosmos. Radiate this love and well being throughout through the cosmic mind. Just let it flow through you, reaching out to the far reaches of the cosmos where all the cosmic mind dwells. Feel the love and well-being flowing. Use a great inner spiritual force. But once it let, gets going, I think you'll find you can just let it flow without conscious effort. And when that happens, just continue to be absorbed in the cosmic mind, feeling the great flow of love and well-being throughout the cosmos to all in need. Enjoy the exhilaration of this action, not of our outer nature, but of our inner nature on the infinite plane through the master within, united with the consciousness of the cosmic, the divine consciousness, our true nature. I think you'll find too as the love and well being flows through you. It'll have a tonic effect for your holy temple after the meditation, particularly. So continue to identify with the cosmic mind, be it, assume it, experience as it experiences, accompanying the cosmos.
find your mind wandering just lovingly and gently bring it back to the breath. And still center of your being, expanded mind to be identified with the cosmic mind, one with the cosmic mind. Soon we'll formally conclude this period of meditation and cosmic attunement to the celestial sanctum. First, we'll formally conclude our period of metaphysical aid, where we work with a silent council in conjunction with the Council of Solace that radiates love and well being to all those who have petitioned and who are in need. Let us say into that spiritual operation of metaphysical aid, if it pleases the cosmic, it is done, so mote it be. Now let us continue a while longer at the still center of our being, at the heights of the celestial sanctum. Grateful for this opportunity to be of service and radiating love and well-being as metaphysical aid. But also this birthright to attune with the cosmic and realize our true nature and true guide in life. Master within, fully connected with the divine consciousness. You may wish to Express a prayer of gratitude for this opportunity to be of service, to attune with the cosmic, and for all those who have lovingly guided us in this lifetime, we radiate love and well-being to them. And then let us begin our descent from the heights of the celestial sanctum. As we continue tremendous speed, we sense the great motion of the cosmos about its axis. We see the superclusters of galaxies rotating about it. And we zoom past the many superclusters of galaxies and see the myriad clusters of galaxies and galaxies and stellar phenomena. Finally, we come to the supercluster where we dwell and myriad clusters of galaxies within it. And finally, the cluster of galaxies where we dwell, we enter it, see the great harmony and order of all the galaxies in that local cluster. And see in the distance, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, it's great spiraling arms, it's inspiring action, following the system in order. And zoom in on the arm where we dwell, past myriad stars and stellar phenomena and see way in the distance our beautiful fiery ball of the sun, our star, and the solar system and the planets orbiting about the sun. And see the beautiful blue jewel of the earth as you come towards it, come to your hemisphere and then your continent. And then your country, nation, in your state or province, and then your city or geographic locale, and so, may wish to say with me now, may the God of my heart sanctify this attunement of self with the celestial sanctum, so mote it be. And let us continue down into our neighborhood, our home and dwelling, the room where we left off, chair or where we're situated. And when we're ready, may wish to stretch have a deep sense of being repaired, rejuvenated, and feeling the balanced consciousness, the cosmic consciousness through our various phases of consciousness, all the more ready for the work and worship of the Rosicrucian Order of the Day in our presentation and our duties after this presentation. Thank you, Fratters and Soros and participants. Now we'll continue with the main body of our presentation. I introduced that we'll be speaking about the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Book of Kells. And we'll start here with one of the, uh, it's called cross carpet pages of the Lindisfarne Gospels. You notice that there's a great cross here with tremendous weaving designs in it. The Lindisfarne Gospels, um, 
date from around 721 CE. And they're most ma likely made by a, in Lindisfarne by the abbot Edfrith in honor of the holy person and mystic Cuthbert. Lindisfarne then was a monastic community in the northeast of England by the sea. The book itself, the um, size of the book is approximately 342 millimeters high by 248 millimeters high. So it's not a very large book, but it's one of the spectacular works of the early Middle Ages, along with the Book of Kells. The Lindisfarne Gospel Manuscript is now in the collection of the British Museum in London. It is on display there under special environmental and lighting conditions. It contains the four gospels, chapter lists, and some letters by Saint, Saint Jerome, passed through transition 420 CE. Using, they use the main body of the text is in Latin and it uses the Vulgate version of the Bible in Latin, a work of Saint Jerome dating from around 384 CE. It is one of the most wondrous and renowned manuscripts to survive from the Anglo-Saxon England, the first half of the medieval period. These manuscripts include the written text in an insular style of writing, a type of calligraphy, which I'll show you later, and much illumination in the book sense of coloring, coloring elaborate cross carpet pages we see here, but also depictions of Mary, the master Yeheshua, the Christ, four evangelists that I'll show you later, and many animals showing a, a love of nature and creation. So as you see here, whoops, as you'll see here, you find depictions in various parts. I've given you zoom in on details. You'll find various creatures, uh, serpents and other uh, animals weaving around, but in a highly geometric systematic way. It gives you a sense of the great diversity of creation uh, but also having a unified impression in the beauty and harmony of the design. You'll notice here is an underlying diagram from our, the scholar R. Bruce Mitford that shows the un, what is the different circles and the different uh, diagonals and grids that are used or similar geometric forms in the Lindisfarne Gospel, this particular uh, cross carpet page to show them together for you to so you can get a sense to match them up. You'll see it here. And you can go back and forth with your eyes to see the various underlying parts where the circles and the uh, grid forms are that the, would have guided the, the artists in creating this. It would not have been done uh, in a, a freehand style with certain uh, minor exceptions. We wanted to make sure that everything was well placed. So when you got over to different extremities, you still had room in to put in your full design. Traditionally, art was highly mathematical in its nature, but it was also highly creative, creative and great deal of passion and creative expression. We find that from ancient times, the medieval period, the Renaissance, and was highly emphasized by a figure such as Leonardo da Vinci as part of his mastership, knowing natural and spiritual laws, but also numerical and geometric laws, like this Lindisfarne artist is creating here before eyes. You see again, too, then the design of the work. It's on calves hide to, or a calf skin, uh, these folios, and it would have been using the latest technology to be able to do these typical, these designs with straight edge and compass, all the mathematical principles that are involved and all the different colors that, and materials that would go into it. Now, we know um, from a later inscription in the Lindisfarne Gospels, that it says that um, various things about the work and very intriguingly, a, a priest named Aldred, who was active around 970 CE. So the text itself is around 721 CE. Aldred added an English gloss with the Latin texts, so that the Gospels were then translated remarkably into Old English. And Aldred wrote in the manuscript, Edfrith, Bishop of the Church of Lindisfarne, he in the beginning wrote this book for God, 
and St. Cuthbert, and generally for all holy folk who are on the island because Lindisfarne is an island. And, the, and Ethelwold, the Bishop of Lind Lindisfarne Islanders, bound and covered it without, as he well knew how to do. And Bilfrith, the anchorite, he forged ornaments, which are on the outside, and he decked it with gold and with gems, and also gilded silver, pure wealth. So we see Aldred is writing later, but scholars generally accept this as an attribution. attribution. And we note in the priest Aldred's statement, um, they wrote, that the book was for God. It was an act of craftsmanship for God and the holy person and Mr. Cuthbert. Other holy persons also worked on the cover, including metal and gem work. You know, in our own work as Rosicrucians and as seekers and um, mystics, that we are to work as co-agents with the cosmic, just as we attune with the cosmic now, we're to put those expressions uh, into work or help create our environment, whatever our jobs and duties are, how we cook, how we interact with others, how we arrange social events, how we do artwork, how we do engineering, how we do science. We use our time to tune with the cosmic to help guide us in these works, just like the artists for the Lindisfarne Gospel in the Book of Kells did. Now you'll see depicted before you another wonderful cross carpet page. Uh, here is the being of uh, St. Mark's Gospel, Folio 94b. And it's interesting that uh, this text, too, this document and text, part of the text, has a wonderful geometry and order, which you can just sense as you visualize around in it. It can be used like a sacred diagram for meditation. As we look at look at it, we'll notice that on the back on the ver on the back side of it, you notice if you look very closely here, you can see the guiding geometry lines, the various points that the artist Ethrith, uh, according to Aldred, uh, worked on. You can see cer a certain grid, and you can also see a little more of the circular arcs that he's working with on a compass. You can see this very highly detailed work. If you put it beside each other. You'll notice here, the circle here is this, this inner circle here. This arc here is this arc, arc here. So you can see you can match up how the design is being laid, laid out back and forth. A tremendous or, work of order and love to do this. The very doing of this we know uh, from the early records was considered an act of prayer, an act of contemplation, and an act of meditation. In a way, it's like walking a labyrinth. The outer nature is still, just like we stilled our breath. We do these very detailed dra drawings. It then allows the inner nature, the divine within, to come out and declare itself. You can see again, there's a love of nature. They're by the sea and the coast um, of northeast of, of, of Britain. St. Cuthbert is known, known to preach to the, to the, uh, the seals and the animals there um, in union with nature wonderful system and order of various creatures intertwined. They're using the Celtic traditions that are pre-Christian, but also on the side with the Christians. There's a marrying of cultures with the spirituality that they're get, gaining from the monasticism that they're learning from the desert fathers and desert mothers in Egypt and Syria, Syria and Palestine. Here again, we see the depiction of the image of a portrait of St. John that we worked with at the beginning for our meditation. Now, the, the Book of Kells is a manuscript that dates from around 800 CE that we're looking at here. It has about 340 folios, and it now measures approximately 330 by 255 millimeters. I say now because during the 19th century, it was actually rebound and there was actually some trimming of the outer part of the uh, of the text, that's why we don't see at the top fully the the head of the uh, Christ and God, the top, but still there largely and suggested. Now scholars tend to indicate it was created at Iona. Maybe some of you have been there. Again, it's on an island off the west coast of Scotland. 
there's a lot of interest in this early monasticism to match the early monasticism of the desert. Going to the holy islands, it's like going to the desert, both outwardly but also inwardly. Now, Northumbria in the northeast of England or Pickland in eastern Scotland have also been suggested, but the general generally towards Iona. Now we know that soon after a Viking raid in 806 CE, this community relocated themselves to a new monastery at Kells in County Meath in Ireland, and hence the name, the Book of Kells. Uh, now the Book of Kells manuscript is now in the collection of the library, Trinity College, Dublin. I think some of you have seen it there. It's on display, it's a tremendous attraction to people. Uh, it's one of the major tourist sites. It's on display there under, again, special environmental conditions. Now we see here John the Evangelist page showing the spiritual master and throne, holding his book, the Gospel of John in his left hand, a large pen for writing. And we note the inkwell, you know the inkwell below here. Often cow's horns were used as inkwells. And surrounding the design, we see a special, we see this rectilinear border here, but it's also mirrored in cruciform shapes and other rectilinear, complex rectilinear forms with great weaving and twisting and turning. So we see both rectilinear form, but also circular forms. And again, depictions of creatures. And we see the great aura, uh, the spiritual master here, the body of Christ and the creator on the exterior. Again, geometry is being used in a variety, a variety of ways. I'll show you here, actually one of my late colleagues, um, Robert Stevick. He, he worked a lot on the geometry of the Lindisfarne Gospel and the Book of Kells and others. And I'll give you some references on this if this intrigues you. You notice here, if you start with the page and you draw the diagonals on it from the rectang rectangular page, and then you draw uh, from the center, a circle that has the radius of half the width across or the diam or diameter of the, the width across the page form that circle. You then form an inner rectangle here. That inner rectangle is used to guide that rectil complex rectilinear four form, which frames uh, the portrait of John. Then what can be done is that you can use the uh, width that is across uh, this distance across here. If that if that is swung, if that is then. Uh, swung up here. So this distance here is used as a radi radius, swing up here. You'll get the degree that that rec complex rectilinear form is extended in. Similar principle is done in terms of the distance of this main border is out here from the side here. If that's swung down here, that'll give you an extension up here. Then similarly, this distance that's in here, uh, I should say that, <clears throat> The, uh, the distance that is uh, from, from swung down here, it'll form this next piece and you keep doing this in all four quarters. So what, uh, what was done there was to take Take this, take this distance down, extend it up to the point, extend off to the side here for the point of the compass and swing down, down on the four sides. Then also what one can do is at the, the halfway point on the side, side here, you can form a, uh, and swing the arc around here and form a diagonal. And then uh, also here you swing down uh, from the center point here, swing down the arc. You can then use that to determine uh, the, cent the center point, these two arcs, to help determine the center point for the circle is the great circle around the halo of uh, John. Well, similarly, you can also take the distance from the off the side here, center the arc here, sw swing up here, and that will determine to you the uh, location of the center second circle. You notice here the first circle forms a tangent on the diagonal we form. Similar action here is we form a diagonal that then forms a tangent for the center point here. We have our two circles determined. 
If you want to see this and review this in detail, uh, you'll see it in the, one of the works by Stevic that I'll give to you. But you see again, what we've then determined by using straight edge and compass is this complex rectilinear frame around the portrait of John and determine the two great circles of his halo. Again, system and order, geometry being used throughout. These principles are like the way that the cosmos or the creation is made through simple laws and principles with, you apply with great variety. You give you tremendous designs like this. These type of motifs that they're using with the circular arcs um, and taking measuring out to form a grid, but also the side of the square and its diagonal later associated with the square root of two, or the equilateral triangle and its altitude associated with the half of the square root of three or the square root of three or the pentagon, regular pentagons, diagonals, golden section also associated with the square root of five and the approximation 1.618. They are using all of those as basic um, tools and motifs and proportions to create the Lindisfarne Gospel, the Book of Kells, but also medieval craft work. See, a lot of these designs are similar to standing crosses and jeweled work of brooches with gems, but also laying out of grand plans and elevations of churches and cathedrals, this time and later in the med medieval period. Here you'll see a depiction of another cross uh, carpet page, this time from the book, the book of Kells. You notice it's got a two barred cross and it has sort of the uh, uh, eight uh, circular uh, medallions. And it's folio 33R. Again, a tour de force of geometry, applying sacred application of sacred number and geometry and beautiful range of colors. One of the things that's wonderful about the Lindisfarne Gospel is its, its rich, use, rich use of colors. We know that uh, um, you know, using the most advanced technology of their time, as I mentioned, the materials for creating their pigments were gathered nearby through a detailed knowledge of the surrounding landscape and plants and environment, but also afar through trade. The pigments were ground in a mortar and pestle or similar. You wouldn't go out and buy them, they'd be made in the workshop. And as we've seen, uh, that colors such as green, blue, and blue were colors associated with the brilliance of the, of the heavens and divine light. Now, artists commonly use red to convey um, firelight and sunlight and the brilliance of gold. Some of the colors of the Book of Kells have faded a bit, but you can get some sense of their brilliance. The Lindisfarne Gospel colors are Lasted, lasted well, and there's been various spectrography analysis to determine what uh, materials that they were using and where they would have come from. We know from biblical passages, such as the book of Revelation, but also the description of the, the Old Testament, the, um, um, uh, the earlier Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible associated with uh, the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon and the uh, different jewels that were worn by the priests of the tabernacle in the Temple of Solomon, and the various colors described in the symbolism of the apocalypse. Um, many of these were described um, by one of the most learned persons of the Middle Ages who lived in Northumbria, uh, in the northeast of England. The bead is also known as the Venerable Bede in his commentary on those parts of the, of the Bible. Here we see a, a tour de force of geometry and creativity. It's called the, Chi, the Cairo page. In a way, it depicts creation. It's one of the most dramatic displays of the, the word going forth and from creation. Here we see, you'll see here the head of Christ and you'll see the great text is in Latin, but here would just be the monogram, the Cairo that's associated with the Christ, the Christ consciousness process. This is by the opening of St. Matthew Nativity account, Matthew 1 to 18. So we're talking about the Nativity account, the going forth of the word, the formation of the Christ. In a way, we see it spectacular in visual form. It's an inspired, inspired work. You can imagine the type of detailed work that's going uh, on here to be able to create such, such a work. And the magnificent symbolism of the colors again. Another 
wonderful work is that of the uh, uh, Book of Kells showing the four uh, evangelists. Now you'll call evangelists, uh, Matthew is depicted as the human and John the eagle and uh, Mark is a lion and Luke is a bull, but there, this fourfold structure was associated with various fourfold uh, principles throughout the universe, like the four seasons, the four directions, the four elements and four stages of human life and various spiritual principles associated with the uh, evangelist, such as John starts high with, in the beginning was the words, like the eagle flies high. And Luke's te text talks about the sacrifice associated with the to made sacred that the master Jesus undertakes associated with the sacrifice of the bull and so forth. Here we see another page from the uh, from the book of, book of Kells. It's a canon tables, folio 2v. It shows again here some of some of the tetramorphs of the evangelist, and here we see the, the master Yeshua, the Christ figure holding the tongues of two creatures in harmony and master and guiding the harmony of the gospel text, the story to do with his life. And we see a concordance here of different parts of the gospels associated with these three gospel figures, the different parts of the gospel stories that match up with each other uh, that is depicted in the book of Kells. Here we see from the book of Kells, uh, the beginning of Matthew one to three, folio, the folio AR, and this is, and you notice again here, we have the word, it's largely in our oral culture, very few would be able to read and write. So to be able to see this book and it's conveying divine law in itself was very intriguing and awe-inspiring. The texts themselves appear to have had liturgical function or ritualistic function being shown during, during the liturgy being placed on the, on the altar and exemplification of, of the word of God during the uh, very, various liturgies and services. Uh, they'd also be an attraction for pilgrimage so people could see um, not only uh, relics of mystics and saints, but also this wondrous work of the text. In a way, it became a tabernacle or a temple of the word. Uh, we know from various descriptions of it from the early medieval period. Also, we see depicted here one of the many pages. These are the most common pages, the ones with the insular script of calligraphy for the Book of Kells. Here we're looking at uh, Matthew going from 3 to 26, um, folio 8 verso. And there's various people today that can reproduce these scripts. And there's also been computer uh, uh, software to, to work on it as well. But you see there's the love of delight of nature and coloration and symbol of colors as they work through the story of Matthew. Here we see again the Lindisfarne Gospel. It's one of the cross carpet pages near the beginning of the book, verse 2, 2v. It's one thing that you may wonder, well, how did these texts occur? Because they seem to be way, way out uh, in various parts of Britain and Ireland, these things are happening, but actually, the massive communities in Ireland and northeast of England, more specifically Northumbria, had considerable contact with people, practices and cultures of other parts of Europe. Um, and through it, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, we know people traveling to those, but also people from these countries traveling to the northeast of England and Ireland through trade and chant, learning how to uh, learn chanting uh, from Eastern, Eastern practice, craft work and theology and all other activities of cultural exchange. And it, they were living by the sea so they could travel well by the water. It was easier to travel large distance by water in those days. And the spiritual and monastic practices, as I alluded to, of the desert mothers and fathers helped shape the inform the monastic practice of early medieval and later Ireland and England. The desert practices and solitary places for spiritual retreat were adapted to holy islands off the coast of Ireland, such as Skellig Mine, Michael, which you may have traveled to, which is off the southwest coast of Ireland, which was the westernmost point of Christendom for about one millennium. And also in Britain, such as the Farne Islands. It was a place for solitary retreat. In a way, we did a mini retreat when we did a tomb with the cosmic. 
And then the mans manuscripts, as I mentioned, appear to have a, a ritual, liturgical and ritual function, but uh, services as expressions of the word of God. And the two manuscripts attracted people from far and wide to behold and witness these elaborate and beautiful works. As we take time with this one, we can get a sense too that once they're completed, these illuminated manuscripts became sacred diagrams, mandala like for our meditation and elevation. We have a sense a great sense of order and system in them that we feel that then it helps attune us with a great system and order within us. Now we'll conclude shortly, and as we approach the conclu my concluding statement, Karen will provide with you some resources. Uh, for this presentation in the chat and also including a uh, PDF. And also soon she will enable the chat for you to make comments and allow us allow you to unmute if you wish to ask a question. So in conclusion, we've explored the Rosicru Rosicrucian laws and principles and various mystical aspects and their application to early medieval illuminated manuscripts, the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Book of Kells, both highly creative expressions of a sacred worldview and mysticism. And they can inspire us to do likewise in our own life, to emulate the cosmic, to pry Rosicrucian laws and principles at every opportune moment. So that just like this beautiful carpet page and other beautiful pages of, those, of these manuscripts, that our life and environment and relationships are like that type of beauty and harmony as well. Thank you. <laughs>